my name is Nancy Kramer. I am um, the program coordinator and uh, kind of president and founder of Northwest Colorado Cultural Heritage Program. Um, this is a five county regional program where we tell the stories and, uh, of the people and places of Northwest Colorado. And so we've been in existence for almost 12 years now through a partnership um, through Colorado History and the Colorado Tourism Office. And so um, in, in um, our telling the stories, uh, we also have worked with um, 17, 18 communities in the region to talk about what their needs are in helping to tell their individual and then again collective stories. And in South Route and over in Rio, in Yampa, the town of Yampa and uh, in Rio Blanco County, uh, Meeker, they are the uh, bookends, so to say, of the Flat Tops Trails Scenic Byway. And my program has gotten involved with the uh, Scenic Byway program with the Colorado Department of Transportation. There's 26 scenic byways in Colorado, which is very impressive. And so tracking of the byway and its rich cultural heritage, um, we have discovered that there is a need and um, in fact a requirement to retain its status as a byway that we needed to do a corridor management plan. And the last one that was done was 1994. Well, they're saying that what you need to do is update these every 10 years, and it's like, oh, I guess that's not <laughs> happening. <laughs> so as part of my work with the communities, uh, we decided to look uh, for some resources to work on the corridor management plan, which um, we were very fortunate to find out about a wonderful program at um, CU Boulder. And it's a Masters of Environment program, and uh, they have a capstone program. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with capstone program, and I'm going to let the team maybe describe it a little bit. Um, but it's a wonderful program where teams of masters, master students come, and they work with uh, organization on uh, projects for nine months, mm -hmm. and um, so I was fortunate to work with CU and go through the application process and interview and meet a wonderful group of students. Um, Joey Putman, Daniel Raggio, and uh, Aviva North. And they are here today to share both the story, um, stories of people and places in the flat tops, but also about their work in establishing this corridor. We were kind of forgotten about 1994. We're establishing a solid, comprehensive um, corridor management plan. They have been phenomenal. Their research, their work, they held community meetings, in a uh, community meeting in Yampa yesterday, and on Tuesday they had a community meeting in Meeker. So I am very proud of the, the team, and I am proud and honored to introduce them for their presentation. so much Kramer as she told all of you we're part of a professional master's degree so instead of doing a thesis a thesis we focus more on like a real world project and the project that we all chose was to help develop this new corridor management plan for the flat tops trail scenic byway and it's really just been such a privilege to to spend a lot of our summer up here kind of learning about the history and the values of the communities in northwest Colorado and uh, our title already kind of suggests it, but the one big thing we want all of you to take away today is that we view our work that we're doing currently on the corridor management plan as work that's really kind of upholding sort of the history and the conservation of the flat tops and the greater Northwest Colorado region. Uh, so our work sort of like that history uh, realizes that scenic beauty is something to be valued uh, that this place, the Flat Tops, is incredibly special, but that it needs to be managed properly so that we don't lose it. And so I'm gonna jump into some of the history that most of you probably have already heard some about, but when we go through some of this history, I want you to be thinking about why does it matter to us today? Why is it important for us to look back on this history of conservation? 
a lot of conservationists today joke that they're in the business of managing loss. Um, in the US, we lose about a football field size of land, natural land to development, about every 30 seconds in this country. So that's just a statistic for all of us to keep in mind as we kind of jump back in time and we think about, you know, what are the pieces that we can take away from this history of conservation? What can we learn from it? And how are we using that in our project this year? So a lot of people who live in this area already know a lot of the story about Carhartt and Trapper's Lake. But before I jump into his story and his contributions to the region, I actually want to take you back slightly before his time. And so we found a couple historical Colorado newspapers that actually kind of show a discussion about what to do with the land of the flat tops even before Carhartt came and made his mark in the region. So these, these newspaper articles show that there was a discussion to possibly make the flat tops into a national park in the late 1800s. It would have been like the second or the third national park in our nation's history. And I'll just read some excerpts from these articles because they're really fascinating. So this article was uh, published in 1889 and it is, it's taking a favorable view of creating a national park. So it says the location where this new park lies is partly in Garfield, Grand, and Route counties, and it is principally on what is known as the flat tops, large tracts of partially level ground situated above the valleys. They are practically of no value as they cannot be used for farming purposes, the altitude being too high, and for grazing purposes could only be used after the month of July, as it is generally about that season in the year before all the snow is gone. And then it continues later on saying, the scenery is beyond description. The streams are well stocked with fish and the game is plentiful. These are three attractions which will find favor in the eyes of the public. So here, just from the small snippet of an article in 1889, you can see that there were some people who were already trying to think, oh, what can we do with this land? Maybe we should preserve it for scenic beauty. This is kind of one of the first areas where we see scenic beauty being talked about as some some kind of value to the land. But not everybody thought of it as a good idea. So here's another article that says, the scene, or sorry, I just read that one. This one is arguing against the National Park, and it says the Rio Blanco News is out against the proposed National Park in the east part of Route County. It says the proposed reservation will take all of the timber of the area and four townships of good farming land and it will kill Meeker and the west part of the county deader than a smelt. <laughs> so for me personally, I think, you know, just when, when you compare these two articles, you really see that even before Carhartt, there's already this discussion happening about what do we do with this land? Some people want to use it for agriculture and grazing. Some people want to protect scenic beauty. So there's already this conversation going on about what do you do with landscapes? And then a very famous Teddy Roosevelt entered that conversation in 1901 when he came to the flat tops to hunt mountain lions. While he was there traveling during his hunt, he realized that a lot of the local people were really dissatisfied with the land management that was occurring in the area. At that point in time, it was known as the White River Plateau Timberland Forest Reserve, which is kind of a mouthful. But that was, it was designated as one of the first forest reserves in the country and it was managed mainly for timber production, but he had learned that a lot of the local communities wanted an expansion of usage. So he changed the designation to a forest reserve, which then kind of allowed for foraging and a little more access other than just timber production. And then later in 1905, Roosevelt is really the one who kind of helped establish the forest service under the USDA. So you can kind of see that he was kind of inspired by his visit to the flat tops and what he heard from those communities. So this place has really kind of had a long history of how public lands have played out in our country. And then that's where Carhartt enters the story. As a lot of you probably already know some of the details of this story, but Carhartt was um, a landscape architect for the Forest Service. And in 1919, he was sent up to Trapper's Lake 
and his task was to survey Trapper's Lake to create basically a resort. He was sent to, to look at where they could put an automobile loop around the lake and then also survey sites for 100 homes, two commercial sites, and a marina. And no one really knows exactly what happened to Carhartt when he was at Trapper's Lake. There's many different versions of the story, and his time there has grown almost into a kind of mythology. But what we do know is that he came back from Trapper's and suggested that it should not be developed, that instead it should be protected and it should not be turned into a resort town. And in December of that same year, 1919, he met with Aldo Leopold, and he documented that meeting with this memo, which the font is really small, but I'll read it. But in this memo, he really starts beginning to lay out his principles for wilderness preservation. So he wrote uh, that their meeting talked about how far shall the Forest Service carry or allow to be carried man-made improvements in scenic territories, and whether there is not a definite point where all such developments, with the exception of perhaps lines of travel and necessary signboards, shall stop. And he goes on to say that in forests there's a great wealth of recreational facilities and scenic values that the Forest Service hasn't quite tapped into yet. And then he really says, he gets into the importance of protecting these scenic places, saying that there is a limit to the number of lakes in existence. There is a limit to the mountainous areas of the world. And there are portions of natural scenic beauty which are God made, in which of right should be the property of all people. There is no question in my mind, but that there is a definite point in different types of country where man-made structures should be stopped. So, you know, even just from this memo, from his meeting with Leopold, you really start to begin to see the vision that Carhartt was crafting, uh, that he was inspired by the scenery at Trapper's Lake. And his whole idea was that he didn't want that scenery to be overtaken by man-made structures and resorts and marinas. And one of the reasons why he was so against that is because he was already starting to see sort of the damages that poorly planned recreation was causing on landscapes. So I have a little passage that he wrote about his time at Trapper's Lake, and it's a little graphic. It talks about human waste, but I think it's important because it gets into the idea of when you, when you have poorly planned recreation, that it can be devastating ecologically. So he said, the worst condition in the camp was with reference to the provision of human offal the privies supplied were indescribable. There was no attempt to keep them fly-proof, nor adequately house the seats. One of these dilapidated things was designed to serve the entire camp. As a result, many of the men took to the woods. <laughs> at one point, I counted, at one time, 18 stools of human feces with less than 150 feet of the lake, and so situated that they would have been washed directly into the lake by a hard rainfall. The water of the lake and outlet stream is used for domestic purposes. The guests of the camp could not be blamed for using the great outdoors when the privy supply was so filthy and inadequate. So even from that little passage, you really get a sense for how he was developing sort of a wilderness ethic, why he thought it was so important to protect these scenic places because he didn't want to see them, you know, just get thrown to another development where it was going to get ruined by uh, some of our, our lesser instincts as the human species. <laughs> and then this conservation ethic that he was developing continued in the area into the 1930s when the CCC, or the Civilian Conservation Corps, built Pyramid Guard Station, which still stands today right along the byway. But this structure really represents the mission of the Civilian Conservation Corps for natural resource management. And it was one of the first CCC complexes built in the state. And the reason why they built it is so that people could attend to natural threats as quickly as possible. They could be right there on the ground. And this is just an example of how Carhartt's legacy was continued into the 30s. And now Aviva's gonna talk a little bit about how we see that legacy even today on the byway. Awesome. So before I get started talking, I want to play a quick little game of raise your hand. So 
Raise your hand if you knew that this road, County Road 8, or coming from the Brown County side was a scenic byway. Okay, how many of you have driven it? How many of you have driven it all the way through? <laughs> all right, <laughs> that's what we're looking at. Well, kudos to you three. Um, it is a long drive, and as you um, probably know, is not for the faint of heart. Um, so as Joey had mentioned, there's um, a real theme of sort of conservation, um, protecting this really sort of this slice of heaven and gem um, in Colorado. As we were talking with a lot of our stakeholders um, developing this plan, many people said, you know, this is the last place in Colorado where you can go somewhere and not see another person for a day or two. Um, and as people who live in Boulder, um, we can really attest to that, um, <laughs> which is why it's always a treat coming up here. Um, so really, um, as this byway and this road has been developed, it's still dirt. Um, for those of you who haven't um, ridden it, it's most of it is unpaved, um, pretty rugged conditions, but really just going through an amazing um, portion of Northwest Colorado. Um, and a lot of that sort of Western, um, those Western culture um, themes um, and history are still on display. Um, you know, even yesterday we were at Mountain Tap and the bartender was asking about my day and I said we were up in the flat tops and he said, oh, it's my favorite fishing spot because I have this one lake that no one else knows about. <laughs> and we've probably heard that about 20 times this summer. Um, so, you know, outdoor recreation is a huge source of why people come up to this area and why they drive that road. Um, they're particularly on the Meeker side and Rio Blanco side, there is a huge amount of outfitters um, that take people on horse packing trips, take them on hunting trips. Hunting is a huge um, driver um, of the economy, especially on the Meeker side, but over here as well, um, by having one of the largest elk herds in the entire country, just being in your backyard here. Um, and then Trapper's Lake Lodge. Um, we are all sporting our Trapper's Lake gear today. <laughs> um, we were there just this week and, you know, this, there's still this sort of ethos and um, culture around Trapper's Lake of keeping this place pristine and undeveloped. And, you know, Trapper's Lake Lodge has this whole thing of unplug and come get away here. You know, they turn the power off at night. Um, so even if you're staying in a cabin and not camping, you're going to need a headlamp um, or some sort of light. So there's really still sort of this like western um, culture and conservation ethic um, that you can really see along the byway in a multitude of ways while you're here so um coming back to sort of our work and how that really relates um as mentioned it's really cool to see how a lot of these ethics and values have you know changed a little bit but a lot of the core values and why people love this area and use this area have stayed the same from the 1800s till now um and part of being a scenic byway is really sort of understanding and promoting that um designation that this is a special place um and you should come here if you can um so um, as Kramer said, we are one of uh, 26 scenic byways that are all throughout the state in a wide range of conditions. Um, I'm sure, you know, many of you have probably heard of Top of the Rockies, which is really sort of on a highway, um, but it's also seasonally closed throughout the year over Independence Pass, um, which is similar to the Flat Tops Trail Scenic Byway, where it is closed throughout the winter and you can only go so far um, in a car. Um, and then you have things more on the front range that are open all year round, fully paved, lots of highway. Um, so you really can get a range of experiences and really immerse yourself in Colorado culture and history by driving these roads. Um, and that's why the management plan is so important because, um, you know, Joey was talking about uh, human waste at Trapper's Lake. And I don't know if anyone else was just getting like, horrifying flashbacks to trying to camp or go anywhere during COVID and summer of 2020. Um, some of those problems still exist today and hopefully this management plan will help, um, you know, iron out some of those kinks um, that are occurring here um, and make a difference for the next 10 years. 
So what exactly is a corridor management plan? Um, if you have never heard of one before, you are in good company. I did not know what these were until February. Um, so these are um, plans that will be going to the Colorado Department of Transportation. Um, they have a scenic byway commission that includes representatives for different byways, um, as well as full-time staff who work for CDOT. Um, as Kramer had mentioned, they are now requiring these plans to be updated every 10 years to keep your designation as a scenic byway. So that's really goal number one, is get this plan done and keep this place a scenic byway, um, which is uh, sounds a little bit easier than it is. Um, and many, many other byways are in a very similar situation to the flat tops where they have not been updated in 15, 20, 25, 30, 30 plus years. Um, and a lot of different groups um, are trying to activate and create new corridor management plans this year, um, especially because of all of the federal funding that has been coming down in the last few years. There's a lot of opportunity that with a new corridor management plan, you can apply for grants for updating your signage, helping with road conditions, um, getting assistance on any other maintenance work um, that might need to be done. So there's sort of a movement right now um, in the state of trying to update these plans in the next year or so. So in terms of our corridor management plan, um, most corridor management plans are totally public access. Um, you can find them on CDOT's website so you can find the flat tops um, old one, you can look at some newer ones, um, but we really want to show you sort of our working index that we are developing. We are almost done with our first draft, which is really exciting. Um, and I just sort of want to showcase the wide sort of swath of topics that we are covering. Um, it's everything from sort of road safety, accident reports, conditions, um, to sort of tourism patterns and promotional aspects, um, to history, culture, geology, geography, um, any type of discipline you can want, <laughs> it is most likely in here in some form or another. Um, so it's been really fun because we've sort of gotten to dip our toes in the water of learning about the history how that and how that's really played out into how people value this area and what they want to see happen here. Um, a lot of, Daniel will talk about this in a second, but a lot of our work this summer has really been listening to the people. You know, we sort of, I like to joke at least that we're basically just doing the grunt work for these communities because we're putting in the recommendations that they want. We're trying to transcribe their values and how they feel about this road and how they want to manage it. Um, and it's really us sort of compiling the research, compiling that data um, and putting it into a nice plan that hopefully everyone um, in Yampa and Meeker will feel that they have some ownership over and are really excited about. So I will let Daniel talk a little bit more about the logistics of our project. Did you have a question? Just real quick, is yeah. this for the federal or state or both? So this is a state byway. Um, it is not federally registered. I believe there's, you can correct me, Kramer, there's six in Colorado that are national national scenic byways. yeah as well as state um, but yes this is just a state one um, so yes great clarifying question so in terms of like what we've been up to um, we started this project back in February as part of our capstone um, with the University of Colorado we've really been essentially starting with me we met out with the Route County Commissioners back in April. We met with the town of Yampa back in April, essentially just to get an idea of who we're working with, who are our stakeholders, get that idea of where we're gonna be working to. Um, in May, we went out and we met with the community of Meeker and the stakeholders out in Meeker and over on the White River side to get an idea of kind of what their values, the community's aspects over there. Um, and they're just essentially just to get to know everyone. Um, Starting in the summer, essentially in May, we spent most of our time out in the flat tops um, and within these communities. We spent a lot of time working with individuals um, such as the town of uh, Yampa. We worked with the Forest Service. We worked with the commissioners. We worked with the various transportation departments within both counties just to get a sense of what is important about the byway and the region itself. We'll go over more of that later, but essentially it's just to get an idea of like, what is the scenery? What's the road like? 
travel like we wanted to travel the road too so in june we actually got to drive the byway for the first time to actually experience the dust gravel and the actual beauty of what inspired carhartt so that was something that was really special for us we got to see dunkley pass we also got to see ripple creek pass at those overlooks and got to see what inspired the conservation history within the areas um, Another fun fact about this byway is also one of Colorado's first byways um, as part of the enabling legislation in 1991. So um, I'll go a little bit more into that later, but it is one of Colorado's first 14 byways that was designated. Um, as we conducted those stakeholder interviews, we also sent out newsletters to all of our stakeholders just to keep them updated on our project, making sure that they have an idea of, hey, this is what we've been doing. We want to make sure you guys are informed about what our trip is involved. Make sure if anyone is interested, they can get involved with it by getting in touch with people who have been contacted through our engagement process. Um, when we weren't up here in beautiful route and Rio Blanco County, we were back in Boulder. We were conducting a lot of research. Again, a lot of the research that Joey did was reading about the conservation history with uh, Arthur Carhart, making sure that we understood kind of what is going into this corridor management plan. We wanted to make sure we had a variety of information that we were all well versed in to provide for this plan to make sure that nothing was left behind. We also wanted to make sure that we were looking into the histories and the values that the people were providing us. Um, making sure that we understood kind of the more controversial subjects, making sure we had more information about those ideas and their values. So that was something. I'll go a little bit more into the asset map in a, the next slide, but essentially we provided, we developed a ton of maps just to make sure that this quarter management plan is also well informed with visual graphics. We wanted to make sure that we had a baseline assessment of every single sign that was out on the byway that was historical or interpretive um, that provided that information to any travelers that drives across the whole byway. We found that there's about 31 interpretive signs scattered along the byway. Most of them are in the White River National Forest side, so you have to drive a little farther for them. But we did discover that there are a ton of signs. Some of them are outdated, but we also wanted to make sure what was, what information was current and what information needed to be just updated slightly. Um, but a lot of it still in great conditions, even with the harsh winters up at like Ripple Creek. Most of those signs probably not going to need to be replaced for a couple years, which is fantastic. And then we spent the majority of our time writing a 36 page document that is going to be sent off to the Colorado Department of Transportation eventually. But it's not even done yet. So again, we're only at 36 pages. This is probably gonna end up being a lot more. So um, it's just text and tables right now, but we're looking at making it look really nice. Um, this is something that will be shared to the Flat Top Trail Scenic Byway Committee that will actually submit to the Colorado Department of Transportation. This will be a public facing document so we'll be able to see this type of work once it is approved by the Colorado Department of Transportation. So uh, this is actually one of the maps that we made. Um, this is a visual of just showing where every single sign exists along the byway of all those historical signs. Um, they range from hunting information, public fishing easements, a fire that happened in 1889, um, 1898 I mean, but essentially these signs provide historical context to what has gone on in the region. It provides information about the U people, about how this used to be their historic hunting grounds. Um, it provided information about the Meeker incident where the Ute tribe essentially killed the White River Indian Agency um, and where the White or the Battle of Mill Creek happened where certain things occurred in Rio Blanco and Route County history. So these signs provide a lot of historical information. There's also a ton of signs down at Trappers Lake as well that provide history about Carhartt's journey and his um, efforts to preserve the lake to what it, what you see today as this natural beauty of wilderness. So this is something that we've provided. Essentially, you get to see where things are. The other maps that we've produced were essentially hunting zones where private, where private public land meet. Um, we've developed maps that show every visitor amenity within both Meeker and Yampa just to provide an ass uh, assessment of where visitors can go if they're driving the byway, how to provision for your journey, as Nancy Kramer would like to say, um, essentially preparing yourself to drive an 82-mile road 
that can be very limited with services and just making sure that you're aware of kind of what situations and what hazards may exist out on that route. So within our interview results, we've really found that a lot of the communities have very similar results. Both Meeker and Yampa have determined that public lands are very important for everyone. Um, the community aspect's very important, being able to know who your neighbor is and being able to just be that community that you can trust is super important. But there's also that historical aspect of the extractive industries as well. Um, both Rio Blanco, Route County, and Moffitt County, this whole Northwest Colorado region has a very rich history with the oil and gas industry as well as the coal industry, as well as agriculture and ranching. And we wanted to make sure that we heard that those values within our interviews. And we want to make sure that that's still within our plans just to make sure that we provide that information for them too. And we base our recommendations off of that. Um, it's also a place where you need to have grit. It's, it's something where, yes, you will not see someone for a couple days if you are out in the wilderness or in the forest in certain times of the year. Uh, being able to survive on your own for Nowadays, three hours on this drive is something that is important. But back in the day, it used to be, you might need to survive for a couple days, if not up to a week, just traveling over the area um, because of the weather and how the winters can be harsh and it could snow all the way into August. Um, one of the commissioners ended up telling us like, you could get snow all the way up to the 4th of July and you can get snow after the 4th of July. <laughs> it's one of those things where it's Colorado weather. It's unpredictable. So it's at, at Trapper's Lake, they were saying that they could see snow as early as August 25th. And it's just one of those things of being ready to travel this byway is something where you have to have grit, you have to have that ruggedness and you have to have that essentially the hardness of being able to survive out here. Um, a lot of the information that we were trying to figure out is, does this byway provide any information or any economic benefits? We weren't sure. There's not a whole lot of information out there. Um, there are some reports, but they're mostly statewide reports. But essentially, a lot of people said, yes, it might provide some benefits, and there are benefits there, but we really can't quantify them with an actual number. But we do know that during the summertime, which is our next point, is this vegetation level, it's packed during the fall. It's hunting season, archery starts in September and it goes all the way until the end of November until snow starts really hampering the conditions. But that hunting season for elk and deer is really important for the local economies in the area. And that's something that visitation during that time, it's really saturated. During the summertime, we've heard that people don't want to have too much more visitation. There is opportunities though for kind of more guided tours, those kind of cultural tours to certain areas, um, as Aviva would like to describe them, more boutique tours, um, to essentially take you to like Trapper's Lake, show you around, give you the history lessons of the area, um, and or do like a gravel bike ride from Steamboat to Trapper's Lake, stay at the lodges there, and then ride back. There's opportunities for growth there, but how much, that's something that we wanted to have the committee explore to make sure that they develop the right assessment and make sure that we're not over promoting this. Um, as we've heard that this is an area that is really a scenic gem and that we don't want too much um, growth happening and people don't want too much growth happening here. Road conditions, most of it's paved. It's, there's sections of it that are paved and on the Route County side, there's about 10 miles of it. After that, you're on gravel. And um, everyone has said that they don't want it paved. So. You're gonna have to deal with the gravel and the dust. <laughs> um, and that dust can be pretty bad. The, the biggest thing that we've heard is how to mitigate that dust during the summertime. But um, that is one thing that everyone loves is that there's no need for improvement of the road unless it's dust mitigation. Um, tourism, essentially it's just understanding that you are gonna be going through private and public lands. Um, there are gonna be livestock grazing out there so don't pet the fluffy dog that looks really cute because that's a very hard working dog so understanding that that dog um that may not have a leash or any identifying tags to it is a hard working dog just leave it alone that's one of those things and making sure that there's just that understanding of respect and etiquette out on the road just making sure if that gate was open when you got there 
leave it open. Don't close it because they might be moving cattle or sheep through the area. Um, and the, the Forest Service does operate grazing leases out there, which encompasses the pretty much the entire forest, which is incredible. But um, it's kind of that having that tourism education piece be really important for drivers just to know that, hey, there this is a working byway. This is one of the few, if only the only working byway in Colorado where it's not developed as this tourist amenity. It's there as a tourist amenity, but most of the lifestyle that's out there is built off of working the forest, ranching, and or mining and logging the forest. Um, it is public land, it is what they called the land of many uses um, back in the day. And then the vision for rec the vision for the region for the future is essentially um, having that diverse economic growth, keeping it very sustainable, um, not overdeveloping it, but keeping it small, diverse, and having outdoor recreation be a piece of that puzzle. There's no right answer to this, but it's mostly keeping the, the flat tops as this gem of the wilderness that people come to love out in Colorado. So um, I'm gonna read a couple of excerpts about from our actual development plan or our corridor management plan. This is gonna be from the enabling legislation passed in 1989 and 1991 from the Colorado um, government. Essentially, this was done through executive orders as well as legislation. This legislation is still in effect today, so this is what provides scenic byways with the opportunity to become a scenic byway and stay a scenic byway. So, um, all Colorado scenic and historic byways aim to provide recreational, educational, and economic benefits to Coloradans and visitors by designating, interpreting, protecting, and promoting outstanding touring routes in Colorado. This is going to be from our actual, this next part is from our actual document that we're writing, but the Flat Tops Trail Scenic Byway brings state, federal, and local stakeholders together to protect the regional values of solitude, scenic beauty, and wilderness, maintaining the road as a place for high quality outdoor experiences and unimpaired nature. Our vision for the plan, this is from the recommendations that we are coming up with and just hearing from all of our stakeholder input, is by continuing to protect regional values and lifestyles, the Flat Tops Trail Scenic Byway seeks to become an example of destination management and ecological and cultural stewardship that other byway and tourism organizations can look to inspire or for inspiration. Essentially, we're just trying to make sure that this plan encompasses all of the conservation history, all of the protection management and destination management that essentially other byways can look at instead of just promoting as a tourist asset like you should come here to explore this scenic byway experience all that you have to it we really want to make sure that this plan really develops around the community values as we like to say this plan is built for the community by the community essentially this plan should be something that helps manage and helps protect the forests and the natural resources within the area but while also protecting the community values as well and with that, that is our presentation. So thank you again for listening to us talk about the scenic byway and the history of the area. Agency. Yeah, so we've been working with the Yampa district of the Route National Forest. We actually worked with CPW um, on in terms of a lot of this documentation. Um, and then we've also worked with the uh, White Riverside, the Rio Blanco district of the National Forest as well. So they're actually partners within this project. One of the reasons for the plan as well is just to kind of compile all the information that's out there. Uh, especially in terms of current conservation efforts because there's a lot being done by different organizations be it land management agencies or nonprofits and I feel like a lot of those agencies aren't talking with each other a lot yet but part of the reason for this document is to have all that information in one place so they can all go back and look to it and realize oh this is what's being done on the forest right now 
here's maybe what we should do in the future. And that's also part of the role of the committee is to bring these stakeholders together to um, continue management, um, to continue these conversations and ensure that everyone knows what everyone is doing. This might be a little off topic, but what was the most interesting history that you picked up? <laughs> For me, it was the National Park. I, when I was doing some background research about the byway and the flat tops wilderness and how the forest this is the uh, White River National Forest is actually the second oldest national forest in the United States history. Um, that there was this plan for a national park and that there was this discussion and a lot of support at the federal level too. And just all of a sudden, gone. Um, but like I was on like Colorado Encyclopedia one day and I saw one sentence and I was just like, now hold on a second there. <laughs> what is going, what? So it, it ended up being this deep dive of hours of research and us finding like these articles that back from the 1890s and 1889 saying, hey, there's this proposal for a national park that would have been the third in the nation's history and just how the subject is still brought up today as preserve, conserve, how do we use the land? So that for me, that was the most interesting thing I saw in historical. Oh, mine, I think my most interesting um, piece, what I really enjoyed was talking with a lot of the like ranchers and outfitters here who had so much sort of like generational history of, you know, like we talked to um, someone in Yampa who, you know, grew up in Tonopas and then, or Toponis, sorry, I always <laughs> mix it up, <laughs> and then went to Phippsburg and Oak Creek and then landed in Yampa and we talked to, you know, the Rossi family who's been here for six generations at least um, and just like seeing I think especially living on the front range where everyone's a transplant including ourselves it's really cool to sort of connect with communities that really have sort of deep roots and really interesting experiences in history here yeah. what about you, I love the car art stuff I mean, <laughs> his, his idea of protecting scenic beauty was actually incredibly radical for the time period you know I mean one of the reasons why the National Park Service why you know all the famous conservationists why we remember them is because places like Niagara Falls had been developed beyond you know where you couldn't experience scenic beauty anymore mm -hmm. um, and even at that at the time the early 1900s the Forest Service was not in the business of recreation or protecting recreation mm -hmm. so his suggestion to not develop trappers was incredibly radical and the fact that he had the grit <laughs> to uh to go back to his superiors and say that and really it kind of everything kind of came spiraling out of that i'm surprised that he's not more well known because he's like the father of wilderness basically there's a reason why trappers lake is considered the cradle of wilderness it's what inspired a lot of the wilderness protections and the 1964 Wilderness Act as well, even though the, world, the flat tops wasn't even designated until 1975. Yeah. How have you guys been accepted by the local communities in terms of what you're doing? So multi part, um, could somebody else come forward with a different management plan for the corridor? In other words, what gives you your purview to do this? Great question. And, <laughs> and just, because um, I don't want to see the road ever get paid. Yeah. Okay, because I've driven it a dozen times from one end to the other. Um, but what, what gives you your purview and how have you been received in what you're trying to do? Because after all, you guys are students from Boulder and oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> how, how is that going? yeah um, it's it's been um, really interesting I think on this trip doing sort of our community engagement workshops and comparing them to sort of our first meet and greets um, Daniel kind of maybe sugarcoated how some of those went <laughs> um, so in terms of sort of what why we're writing this specifically. Um, it's really all thanks to Nancy Kramer. Um, she is, you know, the the person of Northwest Colorado and does everything. Um, so 
Um, she is heading up the Flat Tops Trail Scenic Byway Committee, um, so therefore reached out to us as students um, through the Capstone program to help write. We do not have the final say. What we really do is pass on our work to the committee, which is going to be a lot of those stakeholders that we mentioned, you know, forest service people, local business owners, um, ranchers along the road, to really sort of have that final say in submitting it to the Colorado Department of Transportation. Um, and in terms of how we've been received, um, it was a little bit rocky at first. Kramer, you know, has a lot of street cred up here, so she helped us a lot. Um, and um, she was really sort of genius in having these sort of meet and greets in the spring where it was very informal, really just like introducing ourselves, you know, making sure that our intentions were pure um, <laughs> and we're not just doing this for a grade. Um, and really sort of, you know, I think we had to demonstrate that we were going to walk the walk. Um, in the spring, we said, you know, this plan is for you. This is going to have your recommendations, your ideas embedded in it. And from doing, you know, we did over 30 interviews um, with people on both sides and on the byway um, and doing these community workshops of saying, hey, based off of your interviews and our research, this is what we think of recommending. And, you know, but what do you think about this? We still want to run this by you one more time. And, you know, from meeting the Route County Commissioners and getting roasted a little bit in April to um, them, you know, thanking us and shaking our hands yesterday was just an incredible transformation. And I think shows sort of the importance of working with the community and trust is not just gained overnight. So it's been a journey. It really comes down to I feel like listening to how people feel about it. It's listening to their values and making sure we understand that, yeah, we might be outsiders, but we're here for developing your plan. It's, again, this, as I like to describe it, it's a plan that is built by you for you. Um, Kramer can probably elaborate a lot more <laughs> about this, too. I just want to, it's interesting your question because um, even I were about this when we were coming back from Yampa yesterday. The alternative to doing, working with students in the Capstone pro Project and something like this would be to have a third party consultant. Um, and many of the byways have done that. I mean, you're talking 45, 50 grand for the contractual agreements. The, in, in the number of years that I've been working in this region, the energy, the positive energy and momentum excitement in Yampa yesterday. Wow. Number one, they trust the team, they respect them, and they are stepping up. And they're, you know, we left knowing that we would have good representation on the local committee of um, users, uh, government, um, and land use management companies. So this has been actually really a, a fabulous experience. They were able early on to debunk that whole oh, we're students from older. <laughs> <laughs> it also helps that, you know, grad students being consultants. Yeah. The, the, the labor essentially helps. <laughs> hey, you have one more question? Well, because, because I love that area so much, um, do you see any problems with growth either in the valley between Dunkley and Ripple Creek passes the Pyramid Peak area down in there, or going out of Yampa towards uh, Nunkley Pass, is, is there a lot of plans for a lot of growth in those areas? That, yeah, that was sort of a discussion yesterday. Um, really, the main thing we've been talking to people about is if there is room for any kind of growth, more kind of low impact recreation people who are interested in maybe cross-country skiing the area or something like that but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be something where it becomes like a big destination you know that's that's one of the big big things we've talked about in all of our meetings is that they don't want the area to be overused and so it's about bringing in the right visitors and the right number of visitors and it's kind of hard hard to gauge what the carrying capacity of the area is right now so that's probably going to end up being sort of one of the baseline recommendations 
figuring out how do you monitor for each different activity what the area can handle. Yes. And then in Hayden is one of the portals, and I think if you are referring to growth when it comes to residential or small ranges, so it's more off of that portal that I think you'll see some growth in that area. Um, but the other is pretty um, ample would have to actually annex um, if they were to really uh, look at any major growth. Yeah, a lot of the if any desire for development has been mentioned, it has mostly been relating to the actual towns of Yampa and Meeker of saying, okay, Yampa's a little funny shaped, we can all admit. So how do we, you know, get people to stop at that specific gas station or get people to stop at Montgomery's before they go? Um, or, you know, how can we have outfitting and guiding businesses and those tours of starting in Yampa or Meeker and then bringing people out, you know, no talk of hotels or, <laughs> you know, any of that sort of physical development and infrastructure um, on the highway. I saw a question over here. If we have one. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. Yes. Yeah. Yeah.